You're flying through space, dodging stars and black holes. Your speed is so great that you can get from one galaxy to another in just a few minutes. Sound far-fetched? Well, all this can become a reality because NASA has already tested the technology that might allow us to travel faster than the speed of light. Let's look at the space fleet people have now. To fly into space, we use conventional rockets carrying tons of fuel and oxygen. These two substances get mixed and ignited. Fire bursts out of the rockets. The exhaust gases move downward and the rockets move upward, as if pushing off of them. That's how jet propulsion works. This way, we can make the rocket move at almost 5 miles per second. At that speed, you could cross the United States from coast to coast in a mere 8.5 minutes. But if we talk about space, that's very slow. A trip to a neighboring planet, like Mars, takes about 7 months. And a trip to the edge of the solar system would take about 35 years. That's how long it took the Voyager space probe, launched in 1977, to get there. But we want to travel between stars and galaxies. And the nearest star, Proxima Centauri, is 4.2 light years away from our home. That would take about 73,000 years to get there. That's longer than intelligent human civilization has even existed. And if you wanted to travel across the whole Milky Way galaxy, which is 100,000 light years wide, it would take you about 1.7 trillion years. By comparison, the entire universe is 14 billion years old. People just travel too slowly. But even at the speed of light, it would still take 4.2 years to travel to the nearest star. And you'd spend 2.5 million years to get to the nearby Andromeda galaxy. But we can't accelerate like this. That's because the laws of physics say that an object with mass can't travel at the speed of light. A photon of light has an infinitely small weight. But if you want to accelerate even a tiny grain of sand to that speed, you'd need an infinite amount of energy. Maybe even more than the entire universe has. But scientists might have found a way around the laws of physics. To create thrust, you need to push off of something. Ships need water. Planes push off of the air. Rockets use the fuel they burn. But this thing, the M-Drive, works in a different way. A powerful magnetron, like the one in your microwave, sends waves into this cone. It's a resonator. It makes the waves inside bounce off of one of the walls and hit the others. As a result, we have a weak force at the narrow end of the cone and a strong force at the wide end. And if we analyze this powerful force, we'll see that it is directed toward the wide end of the cone. So, the thrust will be in the opposite direction. Now, let's make this model much, much larger and put the M-Drive on a spaceship. The narrow end of the cone faces up. The wide end is turned downward. The magnetron starts to work. The resonator creates thrust and the rocket takes off. It makes no noise and doesn't emit any harmful gases at all. This mechanism can accelerate the rocket much faster than we do with tons of fuel. In theory, we could even reach the speed of light. Sounds great, but in reality, it isn't. Although the inventor of this device tried to prove the M-Drive works, no independent experiment around the world has shown positive results. NASA sponsored the construction of such a machine in a laboratory, but it didn't create any thrust during the research. Another option that would allow us to travel much faster than the speed of light is the Alcubierre bubble. A Mexican scientist has figured out a way to use the general theory of relativity without breaking the laws of physics. Let's say we have a spaceship on a space-time blanket, and it needs to make a trip to the other end of the blanket. Instead of just moving from point A to point B hundreds of thousands of light years away, the ship starts pulling the blanket toward itself. As the spacecraft folds the blanket, point B moves toward it. Now the ship needs to travel a much shorter distance to point B. It makes a quick trip and then straightens the time-space blanket back to normal. Voila! So such a spaceship doesn't need powerful engines that will burn tons of fuel and oxygen. It would move in a kind of bubble. But the hardest part is creating such a bubble. To do this, we would need an amount of energy roughly equal to the mass energy of all of Jupiter. That's more than we can produce on Earth. And still, scientists are planning to test this technology on a small space probe the size of Voyager. But this experiment might last for decades, or even centuries. Now scientists are trying to reach at least 20% of the speed of light using a laser. And they're planning to get to Proxima Centauri in about 30 years. It's likely to happen like this. 
A mothership will launch from Earth. It'll carry thousands of fingernail-sized space probes. After reaching orbit, the mothership will launch the probes into space. Each probe will then deploy a sail, a thin, reflective piece of material the size of a parking lot. Then people will focus a powerful laser beam from Earth directly onto the probe's sails. This will give them an acceleration 1,000 times as strong as the acceleration of free fall on Earth. One by one, the probes will launch and head for their destination. We won't even have to maintain that laser beam all the time. If you turn off the engines of a regular ship on the water, it'll start to lose speed due to friction with the water. But space is an almost perfect vacuum. There's literally nothing there. So there's no friction. All we have to do is accelerate the probes to the needed speed. At 20% of the speed of light, these probes could reach the sun in just 40 minutes. But instead, they will head for the star Proxima Centauri. After about 30 years of travel, four more years will pass before we get a signal from the probes. There are several exoplanets in this system, and some scientists hope to find at least traces of life there. But this sail technology can be used in space even without a powerful laser. We can use the sun. If we create a sail the size of a soccer field and unfold it in space, it'll start catching the sun's rays. And since the surface of the sail is reflective, the rays will bounce off the sail. This will create thrust and propel the spacecraft. One disadvantage of this technology is that we can only use it inside the solar system. In cold interstellar space, the sail won't be able to catch the sun's rays or solar wind. Another candidate for faster than light travel is an ion thruster. Like a conventional rocket, a spacecraft with ion thrusters would be propelled by gas ejected outward. Only, in this case, the gas would be ejected not because of fuel combustion, but because of an electric field. We'd need to create a powerful electric field inside the engine. Particles of gas passing through this electric field would get accelerated and ejected outside. This would create thrust. And although the acceleration in such an engine would be many times weaker than in a conventional rocket, the ion engine would be able to reach higher speeds. NASA was planning to build an ion-powered spacecraft to fly to Jupiter. Ion engines consume a lot of energy, so the ship was to be equipped with a nuclear reactor and lots of solar panels. Eight large engines were supposed to accelerate the spacecraft to about 56 miles per second. At this speed, the trip from New York to London would take one minute. So far, this technology has been actively tested on different space probes, but it can't provide a solution to how to travel faster than the speed of light. Perhaps people will still be able to travel between galaxies in conventional rockets, but they'll need to use some sort of shortcuts called wormholes. So, back to our space-time blanket. Point A lies at one end, and point B is at the other. Instead of traveling across the entire blanket for millions of years, you can simply fold it. Then, point B will be right above point A, and you can quickly get there through a short tunnel between them. Such tunnels are called wormholes. Some scientists believe that wormholes can be inside black holes. But there are two problems here. The nearest black hole is 1,500 light years away. So a trip there would take eons. The second problem is the hole's gravity. Black holes have the strongest gravitational pull of any object in the universe. Their gravity can crush any spacecraft. That's because the gravitational force increases with every inch you move closer to the black hole center. And the force affecting the nose of the spaceship will be much stronger than the force that affects the tail. The spaceship will stretch out like spaghetti and get torn apart. But there's a theory claiming that a spacecraft or even a person can survive falling into a black hole. But only if the black hole is super massive, like the ones that lie in the centers of galaxies. They can be millions and billions of times heavier than the sun. But even though they're heavier, they're also bigger in size. This means gravity probably doesn't increase so fast there. You or your spacecraft might not turn into spaghetti and might even get to see what's at the heart of the black hole. You're hovering about 18 miles above the yeah. surface of Earth and enjoying the best view of our planet. Whoa, <gasps> that's a starfall. Make a wish. And that bright dot that's moving very fast is the International Space Station. And then the waiter brings you a drink. Wait, mm -hmm. why is there a waiter? Mm -hmm. Well, the thing is, you're on a tourist spaceship, and very soon everyone will be able to fly into space with giant balloons. This is Neptune, 
It's a round capsule with panoramic windows and a 360-degree view. It can take on board nine people in comfortable seats, including eight passengers and one pilot. It also has an under-deck toilet. As the manufacturers say, it's the toilet with the best view in the universe. There's also a luggage compartment for tools and scientific equipment in the roof of the capsule, a Wi-Fi connection that will even allow live streaming, and there's a bar with refreshments. Mm -hmm. Space Perspective, the creators of Neptune's plan to price passenger tickets starting at $150,000. And there's no rocket engines, are there? This thing will go up thanks to a giant balloon the size of a football field. Let's move to the launch pad. Passengers enter the capsule. Engineers fill the balloon with hydrogen. It's lighter than air, so the balloon begins to take off. When the thrust becomes sufficient, the capsule with the passengers takes off from the launch pad. The journey begins. The capsule and balloon go up at 12 miles per hour. That's twice as slow as a person can run, and 2,000 times slower than a conventional rocket takes off. So you won't experience hard overloads, vibration, and noise like you would on a conventional rocket. So you're already at 45,000 feet. It's almost halfway there. This is where commercial airplanes fly. This is the frontier where the weather ceases to exist. No clouds, no wind currents, or turbulence. But no oxygen either. You'd need an oxygen tank to breathe here. But the Neptune capsule is airtight, so you keep climbing. You also notice that the balloon has grown up several times. This is because we filled the balloon with hydrogen at zero altitude. The hydrogen was putting pressure on the balloon from the inside, but the air from the atmosphere was putting pressure on the balloon from the outside. But the higher up you go, the less air there is. Hydrogen continues to pressurize the balloon from the inside, but now nothing is stopping it from expanding. So we need a very dense material that can stretch for the balloon. Humanity launches such balloons with weather probes all the time. They take off and get bigger as they ascend. But at extreme altitudes, the balloon material can't withstand the pressure, and it pops. The weather probe falls to the ground. We don't want the capsule with people to fall, so Neptune won't take off that high. But in case of emergency, Neptune has a parachute for safe landing. It's already deployed, and it's attached to the rope that goes to the balloon. So in case of unforeseen events, the parachute will instantly open, and the capsule will begin its slow descent. The entire takeoff procedure lasts two hours, and you reach the 100,000 feet mark. In human history, only about 20 people went to the stratosphere by balloon. The capsule hangs in the air. Now you and all the passengers have two hours to admire the curvature of the Earth, take endless selfies, and relax. You can even see a blue stripe over the surface of the planet. That's our atmosphere. And if you look up, you can see the most beautiful starry sky of your life. Because there are no clouds or light pollution from the big cities at this altitude, and you can see the stars in all their glory. For the same reason, we send our telescopes to this altitude. Two hours have passed. It's time for the descent. This procedure is slow and gentle too. The balloon is lowered. Atmospheric pressure begins to press on it again, and it shrinks in size. The capsule will land on the water. It has a splashdown cone at the bottom for this purpose. This thing will help dampen the impact on the water so that everything happens softly and smoothly. Two more hours of descent have passed. The Neptune touches the water. Now a ship is approaching the capsule. It takes the passengers on board and takes them to the shore. It also takes the capsule itself on board for relaunch into the stratosphere. But the balloon itself can no longer be used for a new trip. As soon as the passengers touch the ground, their journey is over. The first person to ascend to the stratosphere in a balloon was this Swiss man, Auguste Picard. He designed this round gondola. It was airtight and could take two people on board. The gondola was attached to a huge balloon as big as a basketball court. As with Neptune, the balloon was filled with hydrogen. In May 1931, Auguste Picard and Paul Kipfer began their flight. As they gained altitude, they discovered several problems. The airtightness of the capsule was bad. Air would escape from the capsule, but they were able to fix the problem. They were climbing higher and it was getting colder outside, but the temperature inside the gondola reached 100 degrees Fahrenheit because the crew couldn't control the air release valve, so they felt like they were in a hot desert. Auguste's gondola reached an altitude of 51,775 feet, only 16,000 feet higher than commercial airplanes fly now. 
and 17.5 hours after launch, a goose landed back on the ground. During this and other flights, the scientists collected a lot of data about the wind in these layers of the atmosphere and cosmic rays. He was also the first person to send a radio signal to Earth from such an altitude. Later, Auguste Picard used the idea of a fully airtight gondola to dive to extreme depths. He created a bathyscaphe capable of descending to the deepest point on our planet, the Mariana Trench. Even though the Neptune is much more advanced, it still can't fly into space. It's not even close to it. So this is where Auguste Picard was able to fly to. Here is the maximum altitude of the Neptune, but space much higher. This is the Kármán line, about 62 miles above sea level. Humanity considers this to be the boundary of our planet, so the tourist in the Neptune capsule won't even be able to feel weightlessness. But if you want to become a space tourist and dance in zero gravity, there are a few more options for you. This is a crewed, suborbital reusable spacecraft. The journey starts on a regular runway, just like a commercial airplane. Here you can see the unusual White Knight 2 aircraft. It's as long as a tennis court and consists of two fuselages. Because of this, it has a wingspan as wide as a soccer field, and our Spaceship 2 is attached right between these fuselages. So, White Knight 2 takes off like an ordinary airplane and reaches an altitude of about 12.5 miles. Then Spaceship 2 undocks and begins an independent upward flight. This small spacecraft is the size of a swimming pool. It's controlled by two pilots and carries six passengers. Ignition! The rocket engine is on and the spacecraft begins to gain altitude. The pilots and passengers have reached about 282,000 feet, almost three times higher than the Neptune balloon. The passengers were able to experience weightlessness for a while. Then the spaceship, too, began to land. The pilots didn't start engines anymore. They just glided in the air. Then the spacecraft released the landing gear and landed on the runway like a regular airplane. The creator of this company, which owns Spaceship 2, plans to carry out such tourist flights into space more often. The ticket for such a trip will start at $450,000. That's three times more than the flight on the Neptune balloon. If that's too much for you, we have another option for flying into space. This is the new Shepard spacecraft. This thing consists of a propulsion module and a crew capsule. It launches just like a conventional rocket, vertical takeoff, fast acceleration, and high overloads. The propulsion module helps the capsule reach a speed of about 2,230 miles per hour. At that speed, you could cross the United States from coast to coast in just one hour. The booster rocket climbed to an altitude of 65.7 miles. At this point, the crew capsule undocked and reached an altitude of 66.5 miles. The four passengers on board at this point felt weightless for several minutes. At this time, the launch vehicle descended to the ground and then made a successful landing. A few minutes later, the crew capsule began its descent. It launched three parachutes for braking. Just a few feet before touching the ground, the capsule makes a quick launch of the rocket engines to slow down completely and make the landing as soft as possible. You can become a space tourist and experience weightlessness on this rocket for only $250,000. You're traveling by train and hear the wheels banging against the tracks, but suddenly the train rises and gains altitude. None of the passengers scream in panic because this is a regular thing now. Well, maybe not yet, but it might become our reality anytime soon. Aka Technologies Company is developing such a project. Their goal is to reduce travel time and make trips more comfortable. To travel today, you need to get to the airport, spend a few hours there at the check-in and security check. And only after that can you board the plane. When the plane lands, you need to go through standard airport procedures again and then get to the city. Only after this, your trip is over. It means you use at least three different types of transport. But with Link and Fly from Aka Technologies, you can get to your destination without any transfers. This is a train the size of an Airbus A320. It's as long as four school buses and can hold about 162 passengers. Since it's a train, it can run on the subway tracks right to the city center. So when you begin a trip, you just need to get to the nearest subway station. Once you're on the train, it takes you to the nearest airport, and there, the fun part begins. The train makes a quick stop to get the wings and jet engines attached. So now, your train has a wingspan as wide as a soccer field. The engines start, the train accelerates, and takes off. 
After the flying train lands, the wings get detached again, and you're on your way downtown and your destination with no transfers, without having to wait for a cab. And again, you can get off at any subway station. Transformer planes that can drive around the city are the distant future. For now, this company is developing a simpler solution to reduce airport overloads. Instead of having a plane parked right next to the gate, passengers will board the plane's fuselage right inside the airport's building. The fuselage will then pull out onto the runway, and the wings with the engines, as well as the cockpit with the pilots, will be attached. Here you go, the plane is ready for takeoff. This system will make boarding and takeoff 30 minutes faster than before. The company plans to make different types of removable fuselages. For short flights, they will have a capacity of about 160 people. There will be double-deck cabins for long-haul and higher-capacity flights. VIP cabins can be customized like a private jet. And if all the seats are removed, the cabin can be used as a cargo plane. Link and Fly has a special safety system in case the cabin separates from the wings during the flight. Three parachutes at the front and three at the back of the cabin will deploy automatically. There are also braking rockets that can help to quickly reduce the speed. This way, the fuselage will descend slowly and safely. A few seconds before touching the ground, the cabin will launch airbags attached to the bottom of the fuselage for the softest possible landing. Another option for traveling faster is the Airbus pop-up. It's a kind of taxi that can travel by road and by air. In the future, you can simply order such a cab from your tablet, phone, or even smart glasses and wait for the vehicle to arrive. The car itself consists of a passenger pod half the size of a modern sedan. It can hold two people and has a futuristic design and interface. The second part is the ground module. It's the chassis and wheels for driving on conventional roads. You get into the pod and after that, artificial intelligence does all the work for you. It steers the car safely and takes you to your destination. When you get out of the cab, the pod with the ground module is sent to the nearest charging station. For convenience, charging stations will be located throughout the city, so you won't have to wait long for a cab. But if your destination is far away, a more interesting ride awaits you. Like in the first case, you get into a pod on wheels. The ground module takes you to the nearest takeoff site. There, the capsule gets attached to the air module. This thing looks like a giant drone. It hooks the passenger capsule and flies up, separating the pod from the ground module. Now, it's a flying cab. You can enjoy the beauty of the city from above. When you land on a special platform, the pod reconnects with the ground module and you proceed to your destination while the air module charges for the next trip. Rockets might be another revolution in long distance travel. For now, we use them to fly into space, but in the future, they might completely replace airplanes. Let's say you're going from New York to Shanghai, which is on the other side of the planet. The launching pad of the rocket can be on the water, somewhere in Lower Bay. You board a ferry that will take you to the rocket. Once you reach it, you take your seat along with the other passengers. Countdown. Ignition. The rocket takes off and reaches space. It's now traveling at about 16,800 miles per hour. When in orbit, the launch vehicle undocks from the passenger rocket and heads back to the landing station. There, it will be refueled and prepared for the next launch. At this time, the rocket with the passengers will use its own engine to fly around Earth. It re-enters the atmosphere and lands on a platform on the water near Shanghai. This flight takes only 39 minutes compared to the 15 hours a conventional airplane needs. But there's a downside to such trips. A rocket makes a lot more noise, so landing platforms have to be far away from the cities. This will increase travel time. The other problem is G-force. Standing on the ground, you feel 1G. When you take off in a normal airplane, you feel about 1.5G. But when you travel by rocket, the G-force you'll experience will be twice as strong. And if it reaches 5G, you'll pass out. Back to the ground. In 2010, the number of cars in the world exceeded 1 billion. And by 2030, this number is expected to double. So, we need to fight constant traffic jams on the roads. The elevated bus could be a great solution for that. This thing doesn't actually look like a bus. It's two lanes wide and can consist of several cars. Such a bus will be able to carry up to 1,200 passengers at maximum capacity. And it will run on regular roads. We'll need to equip the roads along its route with rails on both sides. The elevated bus itself will move at about 6.5 feet above the road. This is comparable to riding on the second floor of a London double-decker bus. 
and it won't interfere with traffic on the road. Regular cars will still be able to drive there. The elevated bus will be all electric and driven by autopilot. Its roof will have a large area entirely covered by solar panels. On cloudy days, it'll be powered directly from the rails. Passenger boarding will take place at special stations located above ground. For emergencies, there will be an inflatable ramp light in the middle of the bus. This way, passengers will be able to leave the bus safely. Some concepts of such a bus even suggest that the racks with the wheels should be able to rise. For example, to bypass an obstacle. If some car breaks down right in the way of the elevated bus, it'll lift one wheel rack, move forward, and lower the wheels back onto the rails. Then it'll do the same with the rear rack. This way, the bus will be able to move around the city at about 37 miles per hour. It's faster than driving in a traffic jam. Another option to avoid traffic is tunnels. You would be able to travel through them in your own car. A hypothetical tunnel system under large cities would have multiple entry points. You would drive your car onto a special platform, and the platform would then be lowered down. It would accelerate in the tunnel to 124 miles per hour. You'd be able to get to the other end of the city in just a few minutes. The platform would then lift your car back to the surface, and you'd keep driving to your final destination. Tunnels can also be the future of traveling between cities. First, you'd have to arrive at some sort of a train station. There, you'd board a passenger pod. These pods would hold four to six passengers. Then, it'd follow the tunnel, dock into a pod cluster, and connect with the transporter capsule. Special pumps would suck the air out of the tunnel, and the transporter capsule would move in an almost complete vacuum. Theoretically, this train would be able to reach speeds that are faster than those of commercial airplanes, and even faster than the speed of sound. So you could get from New York City to Los Angeles in 3.5 hours, compared to 6 hours by a conventional airplane. After reaching its destination, the transporter capsule would open, and the passenger pods would arrive at the station. In the future, these pods would be able to travel even on conventional roads. So you just need to order such a passenger pod to your home just like a cab. This way, you'd have the opportunity to cross the United States from coast to coast without any transfers.